So I'm going to start with a little bit about who I am in case you don't know who I am. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've done because sometimes people see the front facing aquarium co-op, we're a business, but on the back end I do a crazy amount of work and study people is what I do. So like while I've been standing here, I've been looking at people, everyone's on their phone, that's typical. Um, and that's what I like to do. So this is a small YouTube channel, the Corey McElroy channel, and it's got you know, probably a hundred videos at this point and they're all business related from sourcing stuff in China when I go and source products to uh, maybe you want to start a podcast, maybe you want to start a YouTube channel, maybe you've got just general business questions, both maybe pet store related and non-pet store related and we kind of dive into all of it because a lot of the stuff will um, translate over, you know, whether you're talking about how much you need to make per table at a restaurant or per transaction in a retail pet store it's all kind of the same you know you've got the same struggles as other people and as business owners a lot of times we're afraid to talk to other people about our struggles we you know we like to say like well we're a multi-million dollar company and we do all this we don't talk about how I almost went out of business and that kind of stuff so uh, my name is Corey McElroy this is the Corey McElroy channel where you'll be able to see this talk uploaded afterwards and uh, we do live Q&A sessions. And that's mostly what today is gonna be. We're gonna dive into some of your businesses, some of your questions, uh, because I have been in a room just like this probably four or five years ago, trying to learn about social media. At that time, I was already on YouTube, and I think I had 30,000 subscribers or something like that. And I myself didn't get a whole lot out of the talk because it was very rudimentary of, it's time to get on Facebook, it's time to start that social media account. And I think in this day and age, we should be much past that, and if we're not, well, now's the time to start, and we're gonna, you're gonna be a little over your head on this, but uh, you know, I want to make sure people get what they want out of it, so I'm gonna pass a mic around. You can ask your detailed question, whether it's, you know, we can go into paid advertising, we can go into, you know, we're gonna spend at least the first part talking about advertising for free, which is where I've made all of my money. I get paid to advertise, which is great, where most of my competitors are paying to advertise, in fact, there are companies that want to pay me to advertise for them now. So you can move in that direction. And so we're going to go to the next slide here. And I'm just going to, you know, a lot of stuff has gone down in the last three years. And this search over here, kind of you, you Google influencers. And now all that comes up is about how they're flake, flaky, they're fake. Does anyone trust them? Are they even a thing anymore? There's bots doing it. And the reality is there's more influencers, and I say influencers, than ever. Everyone with a cell phone is now an influencer as they will market to anyone. I've met people, you know, where they're like, oh, I'm an influencer. And you, you go to like, oh, what's your channel? And you're like, oh, you have 212 people. Like that's, you have an account, but I'm not sure you have influence like you're leading to believe. And uh, so much so that, you know, this stat that I randomly pulled out that all stats are pretty much fake, but people just don't believe in influencers anymore. The reality is, you know, we assume even when good intentions like, oh, he must be sponsored by Aquafina because he's got the Aquafina water bottle. Like every, there's a backlash. And to prove that in real life, um, you know, if you're at a restaurant and you're standing in line, you're waiting, you got a 30 minute wait and someone says, oh, have you had the mozzarella sticks? They're so good. The odds of you getting those mozzarella sticks are through the roof, whereas, if they have a giant sign that talks about how their mozzarella sticks are the best and they've won awards and all that, that won't actually sway you because you'll assume that's been doctored, that's been a lie. And so the, we do believe in people, but now we don't believe in influencers because we know that a guy like me is probably being paid off to say this. And so we have an uphill battle to actually you know, drive sales with the customers we're trying to reach. And the biggest burden is trust. Trust has to be earned, it can't be bought. You can spend $50,000 and you can ram an idea down uh, someone's throat, but that doesn't mean they'll trust you. They might know all about it, but they might not trust it still. And so much so, the more money you put into something, usually the less they're going to trust you. And you can spend $50,000, they're getting Instagram ads, they're getting Facebook ads, it's showing up on YouTube, it's in the Google search, it's retargeting them. And so sometimes they even start getting leery that, wait a second, why am I getting that on this cooking website for aquarium co-op? And it's because we're tracking with cookies and everything. So we might actually be pushing people away. Whereas one person in the audience going, hey, did you know they have this great product? I actually love it. That will do more than the marketing's ever done. And so that's where we're trying to get to. And I would say earning trust 
one of the best ways is to be honest, believe it or not, right? And you can't buy it. And so what I mean by that is there's a lot of companies out there right now that have hired a social media person and they're investing 50, 60, $70,000 and they're not getting the return because the average consumer wants to talk to the owner. They want to know what the actual vision is. And we're so afraid in this day and age that, did you hear what the owner said? They went political, they did this thing. And the reality is you'll still do far better even if you get political than if you were never in front of people. That's where we're at. Cause because we don't trust people anymore, we'd rather hate someone then we, we just won't trust them. So building trust, one of the best things I say is be honest and talk about things that aren't your business. So today a good example would be, uh, I'm gonna point out all of my flaws to you guys, or at least a bunch of them. So that way you'll know that I'm being honest. Like I got weighed a couple days ago. I weigh 306 pounds, right? I have a beard because I think it makes me look older and people trust me more, you know? Uh, I also don't like to shave as much. I get a very short haircut so that I can get out of the shower and not have to put any product in my hair. I like to be lazy. These are all things that are gonna connect with your viewer. I like candy, I like tacos, I like these things, right? And the more stuff you talk about that you like, the more they're gonna feel, hey, I like that too. Hey, I'm lazy too. Hey, I maybe have any, too many pounds as well. And then you can start talking about your product or whatever you wanna do. Now. You could hire someone like I have Jimmy, he's a videographer, he films everything we want to do and stuff like that, but you probably don't have the budget for that. I never had the budget for that. And honestly, we've been all the way through the gamut and we actually received pushback from two, two edited content, stuff that looks too good will do way worse at selling anything than something that's raw. And so now, pretty much everything I film when I go to Peru or wherever I'm going is from an iPhone and it's because uh, it gives that little bit less polished look and we will sometimes dumb down the editing of like, they're gonna think this is so highly edited, we're not being authentic or we're hiding things. A lot of times we get accused of hiding stuff. And so one of the best things you can do is if you're vlogging or whatever you're gonna do is no cuts. And it's also the easiest because you just upload it raw. So when you drop, you know, you're like, oh, that's bullshit. You know, you're like, you naturally think you have to edit that out but that's what's gonna sell the next part of the video of like, well, they didn't edit that out, so then this is probably true as well. And I think the easiest way for most people that are in the room is to start going live on Facebook. It doesn't cost any money, which is great. Everyone has a cell phone, so you're kind of covered there. And it's, Facebook is just less polished than YouTube and Instagram is even less polished, but then also the demographics is people aren't actually buying from there also. So, you know, the social media part, remember in social media, we actually have to have a conversation. And so there's these platforms that are social, but people aren't having a conversation around one picture. It's kind of some comments, but you don't go back and forth. Facebook is like the polar opposite of that, where everyone's gonna fight each other to the death to prove someone's wrong, not prove someone's right, but prove someone's wrong. So, you know, you gotta have a team of people to weed out the people that wanna fight, but, Live on Facebook is very powerful. It only takes once a week and you can show whatever you want. If you're afraid to be on camera, great. You get to be behind the camera the whole time. It's just your voice. If you're super personable, great. It's now you in front of everyone and you, you'll work, you'll progress your way through that. Most people, myself included, were terrified of being in front of a camera at the beginning and now it's easy enough. You know, I don't think anyone looks forward to like, oh, I'm gonna pick my nose on camera and my nose is gonna drip and all that kind of stuff. But those are the best moments that ever happen. When you drop the camera, when your nose does drip, all of that is what brings the realness. And my, I think my best tip, which most video people would disagree with me, is to be more authentic, only film vertically. And we all love to watch video like this, but naturally we get the, they're a novice, they're just trying to be real when they're in the vertical mode. So in Facebook also it presents a little better, but in general, that brings down the corporate feel of like, okay, we hired a team of people to film this, this is our commercial. And it's very apparent in the corporate world when people are reading from a script and that kind of stuff. And I, I would encourage you that if you have a retail store, someone walks through the door and you instantly go, what can I help you with today? And you're able to help that person. Usually if you can't do that, you're not really in business, but 
You should be able to do that. And it's no different than online. Online, someone's gonna go, hey, I need help with X. And then you should be able to help them with that problem. If you can't, that's a much bigger problem in business. But when you can do it, when it's non-scripted, so if someone asks me what's the best fish food at my store, I'd ask what fish they're trying to feed and that kind of stuff. If I do a video where I say this is the best food for bottom dwelling fish, it's gonna come off like, oh, you must be getting a kickback from that company or something like that. So if you let the audience lead the conversation, one, you can look dumb, which is great. That's the best thing you can do is when you look dumb, people believe you. And then two, it'll look non-stage. So that's what we're gonna do today is, I know we've got at least, you know, we've got the nano tank here and then we have, um, what is it, Bruce Pets? Bruce Pets? Bruce. Bruce Pets which is you know, very accomplished breeder that I respect and then a giant pet store I've been to. So we've got the gamut just in the front row and then some of you may just be starting up, some of you may be fans, and some of you may have businesses that aren't even pet related at all, but uh, I've done, you know, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in paid advertising. I've done quite a bit. You know, I guess I didn't finish my bio if you don't know who we are. Uh, like on Facebook, we have 370,000 followers. On, on YouTube, we have 350,000. On Instagram, we have 60,000, and you'd see there's some pretty big disparities there, and that's because I've never found value for our brand out of Instagram, and it's also the most congested, um, I guess, platform with influencers. The least amount of work goes into growing an in Instagram, which is nice, but you also get the least return. You just have to take pictures. You don't have to have a personality. You don't have to act real time, and because of that, even bots can do it. That's If you've read some of the scandals, it's like, there's millions of followers following people that are digitally created. They're not even real people at this point. And so when a computer can do it and the inauthenticity inauth uh, is there, that's why the conversion rate is so bad. And they don't give you uh, a valid way to really link out. You have to have at least 10,000 followers and then you can have a swipe up link. But even then, most users don't go there. And so YouTube, which is great because they'll pay you to advertise. When you make a good piece of content and your video gets watched, you know, I get paid and then I can use that to advertise other places. Facebook, they now will pay also, but you have to get a decently high threshold um, for them to start paying you out and they pay very little, but it's also fairly cheap and easy to amplify your message if you wanted to. But I think what we need to focus on is not how many followers, like 360,000 followers sounds like a lot and it is a lot. But the reality is we only need a thousand of those to buy a product. If they buy a $10 product, it's $10,000, right? And there's lots of big follower accounts that don't help you if they're not buying. And that's what Instagram kind of ends up being. That's what buying followers is. Like I've got 200,000 people in India, but they can't even buy from my business. And if you're a local business, you know, really you're looking for two to 300 people that you can get to come into your store per month and actually get them to buy from you over and over and over again. And that's relatively easy to do in an industry where everyone's going big business and you just go, I'm the small guy. Even when you are the big guy, you know, some of the best things that, you know, if you guys know the brand Jack in the Box, they've given themselves their own like mascot that'll talk to us as real people. And it gives the illusion like it's the head of Jack in the Box talking to us, but you know, even better would be the actual owner and uh, that's all people want to do. They just want to talk to the owner and they want to go, well, what do you think? Do you actually like live bears? Do you actually like the fish you sell? What is the food you feed? You know, if, if money wasn't involved, what would you do? And they also, the best thing you can do also is show when you fail, when the fish shipment or whatever comes in and it's all broken, when that 180 gallon tank comes in cracked and your customer's super angry, one of the best things you can do is live stream that and go, oh no, the customer's gonna be so disappointed. We're, we've already got a new one on the way, so you're building in, if that was ever to happen to the next customer, they already know you're gonna take care of them. That's why I'll buy from the nano tank, is because I saw them fail once before, and the way in which they failed was so good, I will you know, put my money there, as opposed to hiding it and that kind of stuff. And people, they know that fish are dying, they know they come in sick, they know that stuff gets broken, but most people try and sweep that under. Like, we've never had a sick fish at our store, and in fact, like at my retail store, we have the quarantine room and it's put on display. There's you know, windows so you can look in, you can see us treating the sick fish so that we want you to be so hyper aware of it that you know that that's where the sick fish are, not on the floor. And so the same thing you wanna do online is you want to you know, let people know that you're fat so that way they're not like, hey, you're fat guy, you know? 
you want them to like, we've already taken the wind out of your sail on that. Like, do you have an actual question here? Like, we're talking about business though, because there's always going to be the trolls, and every once in a while it's okay to engage with them, but don't let them get you on the petty stuff. If they have a legitimate criticism, that's the best time to, I guess, do that online combat. You know, if they have a legitimate, like, I don't think it's a good idea that you sell NanoFish. And then you can go into like, well, here's why I laid out this entire business plan that made sense. Instead of, you know, your own character flaw of like, you have messed up teeth. Like, yes, I know. Thank you, you know. Uh, so it's real easy to diffuse those and you gain strength from the other ones that are there watching, looking to learn. So what I want to do now is, one, I want to tell you guys while we're doing this to download this app. This is how I'm going to win this event. And not that it's a competition, but I've made it into one. This app is where you're going to get to vote on people that have uh, gave a presentation today. And I, I'm pretty sure I win if I can get three of you to do it because <laughs> no one's going to download this app. And then you got to type in the aquatic experience. And then you got to type in sessions. And then you can get to, oh, Corey gave a talk. And then whether it was good or not. But this is how they are going to evaluate whether I've done a good job and bring me back. And my whole goal is that hopefully the people that really want to learn will take this microphone and give me a question and I will actually help you as opposed to I present you 30 slides of something you didn't care about. Like, oh, he went bananas on Snapchat. We're never doing that. You know, so I've been in the audience and I know and I've been to very expensive conferences like Vid Summit and stuff where you're investing thousands and thousands of dollars. The tickets are eight, nine hundred bucks and you sit there for an hour and you go, they didn't once say anything that was applicable to my business. And it's always the Q&A afterwards that people are like fist fighting to get their question because they know, they know this person knows what they're talking about, but nothing they said applied to what they're trying to do. And it could be as simple as, I've been flagged in my business on Facebook. How do I get through that? I've been through that. You know, there's all these things that, you know, we all feel like, oh, it's probably only me. I won't ask that question. The reality is we're all going to run into these problems at some point and just knowing, oh, that's how you get Facebook off your back on that issue. Um, so yeah, please download that app and at the end, leave a review, review other people. And that was my, this was, had to be included, so I did. You know, that's, this is my sales pitch right here. So, you know, that's, that's the most I'm selling you is you got to answer that. But who has a business or a question or wants to start a business and wants some insight? The first one's always the hardest I know because you're a little nervous. And we'll see if this works. Testing. All right. So that way you'll be able, hopefully, You'll, you'll say it, I'll repeat it, so that way we capture it for online, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'm Scott Beats from the Nanotank. Um, so my question, I know you said that you think Instagram isn't a lot of value, especially, I'm sure, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I do use Instagram and Facebook, and you can link the accounts. Yes. Um, do you think it's beneficial or not beneficial to kind of post the same stuff? Like, So usually what I'll do is I'll post on Instagram, mm -hmm. link it to the Facebook, so it automatically posts. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if I should be doing separate content for each one or the same. Yeah, so the question is Instagram and Facebook, super easy to link them together. You can click one button and now what you post to Instagram will auto post to Facebook and what is the value return on that. In our testing, you definitely get miles more better when you create content for the platform and that's what you know all the elitists would call it and it basically means we're creating a square picture for Instagram and people want something they can digest in 15 seconds. That would be, you've kept them, that'd be like me keeping you here for four hours. 15 seconds on Instagram, like you only get this. You're lucky to get the double tap. They've made it so it can take a second to like or not like. And then on Facebook, you typically have one, a different demographic. The demographic on Facebook is much older than it is on Instagram. So inherently, they're gonna kind of like different things. And when we do stuff that goes viral, Right? So sometimes we'll post something to Instagram and it auto posts to Facebook. On Instagram, we only got 50,000. On Facebook, we might get 700,000 views. And it's di based on the audience. And so if you have time, which most of us don't, it is 100% better to create content for the specific platform. Um, but when you don't, it is, you know, not a bad idea to get it going on both, but people know and Facebook also knows that you're not posting original content and the algorithms are very different. Even though that Facebook has bought Instagram, one of the things to know, like on Facebook for instance, is every post you make that doesn't do well will be counted against you in the next 10 posts you make. 
So for instance, like I know a huge handicap I have, when I post a YouTube video to my Facebook account, it will then underperform the next 10 posts even if I never post uh, YouTube again. And it's because they're rivals, they don't want that. And so when you attend some of the people that are making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of Facebook groups and their pages and stuff like that, they will pull content back down within the hour if it's not getting the traction a post normally would. And so in a mode where we're using Instagram and I take a selfie or I post a little, you know, oh, this thing's for sale and it posts over there, uh, typically we're not following up to see did it do okay in that algorithm. And then one of the biggest things I feel is that if you make something natively on Instagram, there's almost no good way to link back to your website or any information, and Facebook is built to do that. So if we could actually push from Facebook to Instagram, I'd be a lot happier than the other way around. But why people love Instagram is 13 seconds from now, I've now posted on Instagram and Facebook. It was so easy, but you also get lost in the shuffle, and they treat it the same way on Facebook. Facebook knows that's not a dedicated post. You'll always get less traction than if you posted the same picture, then go over to Facebook app, post the same picture, but then a little bit different description, that will get more push than it got from the coming straight from Instagram. So even the extra five seconds will get you more. And in general, I recommend people focus on one platform and actually get some traction and, and learn about that platform and get people coming back there knowing that, oh, every Wednesday night they do a live stream. Every Monday morning they post their new fish list. Every and get them in a routine instead of like, oh, well this stuff is kind of disjointed. They do this over here, sometimes they go live on Instagram, sometimes they're doing this over here. And you know, for a guy like me that has multiple people on the marketing team at this point, we still don't attack Instagram the way it could be, but that is because we found the least amount of returns. And I'll be the first to say, maybe we're terrible at it. But I talked to a lot of people and they haven't been able to find the returns either and that you know, it, it might be an okay platform to invest some money into for uh, brand awareness, but short of that, a lot of people are struggling to find the value. And even Instagram itself, that's why they've gone to vertical videos and that didn't work, so now they've gone to horizontal videos. Like they're trying to figure out where does Instagram fit in today's social media place, and they really haven't found it yet. They keep adopting features, hoping this is the next one. But um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't, I myself don't like posting to both. Like if my wife is posting a picture, I just say, go ahead. Cause I, but if I was doing it, I want to custom curate the content. And, uh, you know, another good example of that is a video on YouTube that goes viral and gets millions of views. You take the same video and you put it on Facebook, it'll get almost nothing if you don't put your own captions on it. You know, when you're watching Facebook, you almost no one will ever turn the audio on ever. And so if you're not, creating your own narrative on there, no one's ever gonna watch. So, you know, each platform very, very different and you can spend a lifetime specializing in just one and never master it. And so, yeah, I would, I would but if, if you get great returns, like if you're like, every time I post to Instagram, people are coming into my store, there's no reason to stop that. But if you're like, I'm doing all this stuff and nothing's resonating yet, that might be a sign to go, well, let's try this avenue. And uh, as a business owner, I feel like, Maybe you guys have got 30 minutes a day to tackle this because you've got a million other things and two things you're putting off. And so that same 30 minutes put into one platform will yield so much more than, well, you know, I'll put this little thing up here and this thing here and this thing here and hope that one of them hits. And the best thing you can do is look at analytics after the fact. Did that get the reach? Did this do, you know, and you really need to figure out on Instagram hashtags. Like you have to know why did it only reach 200 people and why didn't it go viral like the last one? And the same thing on, on Facebook. And Facebook, what's really nice about Facebook, and I sound like I'm a salesman for them at this point, but it's great for small business, is that when you post that same picture or video, when someone shares it to someone else's group, you grab all those analytics. So then when you do have some money, right? You did, you did well at, at Christmas and, and uh, Black Friday come January when advertising's cheap again because everyone spent their budget. You know, Fluval and all the big corporations spent their budget for the year. January is very cheap. Well, you now have all these people that said, oh, well, your selfie next to that catfish was awesome. I loved it. Now you can market to them for, you know, a, a penny on the dollar and say, hey, check it out. We are a retail store. Hey, we are in your local area and that type of stuff. And so you don't really get that 
when no one really reblogs or reshares your pictures on Instagram, so your effort, while a little going in, is also a little coming out. So that's that's been my experience so far when it comes to I actually need you to buy this. You know, there's a lot of but 40,000 people liked it and did a thing, but like, well, did any of that generate money though? That's a whole different thing than, you know, we all like to feel good, but I need to sell 30 of these to keep the doors open today. So that's, that's been my metrics of testing there. So who else has questions? Nobody, huh? No one's getting better at social media. <laughs> I can keep talking. I, I, I'll take, I'll take all right, what do you got? All right, so. I guess the question I've got is, um, my name's Mike Howe, I run a YouTube channel called The Fish Tank Barn, mm -hmm. and I go ahead, I guess the question I have is, how do you, I guess what's changed in YouTube over the past, like, six months, year, you, you hear the, you know, the YouTube gurus talk, they're like, oh, the videos need to be longer now, you know, mm -hmm. probably six months from now, they'll say they need to be shorter, like, what's, what are the real, I guess, tricks, I guess, you know, other than looking at your own analytics, obviously, to, to yeah. manage that whole. So the real tricks for YouTube, the first thing I'll tell you is that anyone talking about YouTube is six months in the past because they don't want to make a statement and look stupid, so they don't make statements till they're sure of it, and by then the YouTube algorithm has already changed. So a lot of times you're getting antiquated info, and if we study people though, that's always true. So when we say that now it's a good practice to put out long videos, it's always been a good practice, it's just now we need to put out long videos that are good to stand out from the other people. That's the difference. And when we look at why are long videos doing better on YouTube, it's technology actually. More and more people have a 4K Roku TV sitting in their living room than they ever have. Oh, they're 500 bucks. This Black Friday, we expect a 10% jump in smart TVs and naturally people that uh, log onto YouTube, they're gonna play long videos in the background while they're doing house chores and that kind of stuff and they will let it play for hours and that algorithm actually operates independently of everything else. So the person that watches three minute dude perfect videos uh, on their phone will get served that. You'll get served that on your phone, but the minute you start up YouTube on the, on the uh, TV, it will serve you completely different videos because it knows your viewing powder, pattern. It's at the point where if it knows you always watch fish videos on Sunday because you do water changes, it will only show them to you then. It doesn't even bother showing them to you on a Tuesday. It already knows you don't watch on a Tuesday. And so even when a guy like me says, well, I upload my video on a Tuesday, everyone watches like, no, well, most people don't. They have a, a schedule in their life that will dictate when. And so much so they're like, oh, we always watch while they're trying to fall asleep. It won't even show you till late at night. And so that stuff's always changing. And we think that they've figured stuff out. All YouTube does, the algorithm, the teams of people they're just trying to figure out what people want to do. And people, you know, as we evolve with anything, right? When we get into the hobby of fish, maybe we're excited by big fish or goldfish or, you know, if we go into the store, I want the big one because that's the one that's more money. It's worth more. Don't be giving me that small one when in reality we might be getting a better temperament with a small fish. And then as we progress in the hobby, now we want that brown fish in the back corner that we've never had before, right? And so our taste changes just like it will on YouTube. At the beginning, we're watching every hilarious cat video, we're watching every trick shot video we've ever seen. Eventually, we get our fill of that. And then we're looking like, well, what else do we want? And that's why podcasts have become so big. And YouTube, long videos are just podcasts. So people are listening in the background while they're doing other stuff, and it's because We've seen it all on YouTube. We've seen that, like, yes, it's a different trick, but I've watched it. Okay, today we're tricking people out on the sidewalk with this magic trick, whatever it's gonna be. And so now we want to learn the original purpose we had for YouTube, and we just wanna learn passively. And so what's really changing is that people are, not so much the algorithm, algorithm just follows people. And so if you wanna be ahead, you have to think about what people are doing. And I've always, my channel personally, has always kind of made long videos because the most annoying thing to me is finding the next uh, thing to play. And I learned that from just listening to CDs. You got like, oh, two tracks you love, and then you're like, oh, I hate that one. And then you're skipping through it, and it, it messes up what you're trying to do, right? Or when you're watching, you're binge watching something on TV, and then it hits either that super loud commercial or it actually changes from forensic files to whatever show it is now. Now you gotta get up and change it to something else. Like you just want to completely you know, forget that it's there, but listen. 
and that's what YouTube wants to do. They just want to keep you on the platform as long as possible, and longer videos naturally do that if they're finding the longer videos that keep someone's attention, and that's the hardest thing to do, but that's been the same game we've always had, make stuff people want to watch, and the longer you can do it, the better, and so, yeah, I don't think there's too many tricks. I mean, every once in a while, there's like, oh, we found a way to game the system. Uh, but yes, watching your own analytics. And most people, they assume there's something wrong going on when the reality is we're just bad. We're just bad, honestly. We're not, we're not Jimmy Fallon. We're not, we don't have a team of 40 writers writing for us and making sure we have great content, but we're competing with those people. You're com you know, if you have 100 subscribers, you're competing with me and Jimmy and my person. And to stand out, a lot of times, you just want to do something different and then get this slow grassroots going and that's all you can do because it's really hard if I start a you know a nighttime talk show I'm never gonna outcompete them so maybe I gotta develop something different and uh, so I've always been the guy that tries to do different things and then see what actually worked and then a lot of times stuff will come for a circle and now you know I've got live streams from two years ago that are going viral because no one was doing two hour live streams but now that YouTube algorithm has learned Oh, if we serve people long stuff, they stay longer. Now they're pushing it where they just suppressed it before. And so luckily it turned into evergreen content, even though it was bad. But I knew that live streams sold a ton of stuff and connected with people and actually helped people instead of, you know, I could spend two hours making a video that's five minutes and we can edit a bunch, or we could talk live and help as many people as we could. And that was getting us much more return in the short term of selling bottles of water. So we focused on that mostly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Who else has a question? We, we don't have to talk just about social media. It could be, I need to market locally in my store. I do a lot of local marketing, even though we're United States wide, too. Yes. Hi. Um, when you're starting a YouTube channel, what is the first thing that you would consider um, in starting a channel? What's the best thing? What's the, the best, best thing, thing? The best thing, I think, is to... Uh, start with just a phone. I see you have a Canon camera there. I find a lot of people will invest a lot of money in technology and they think like it needs to be of a certain quality. And the reality is that can actually be off-putting when you have ridiculously good video and audio and all that and then the content's kind of bad. They see we're trying too hard. We almost want to root for an underdog of like, you know what, I kind of like this person. You know, they're just being real, they're honest. And so something a little shaky and a little, you know, you look down and the audio got bad, they kind of appreciate that. And at least I have noticed that. And that's why we actually revert back to making it look worse because it actually performs better. I would say if you were going to focus on anything, the most important thing is audio. You can have terrible video, but the audio, because most times people aren't even looking at the screen, honestly. They're, they're working on a spreadsheet, they're looking at email, and they're listening to what you have to say. If that is bad, that's the hardest thing to get around. You can do a little bit of tuning and post, um, but everyone's gonna go through the, I'm in front of the camera, it's awkward, I don't like the way I look today, I don't, and the faster you can get like your bad hair day on video and all that and realize that people don't care, the faster you'll actually just make content. And I think live content is the way to do that because your hair will look great, you'll be like, oh, I look good, I'm ready to present today, and then you're gonna drop the phone and then you know everyone's gonna be like, what's going on? Hey, I lost picture. And because all that bad stuff goes on, you go, that didn't even impact the show. No one even cared, you know, <laughs> but you're so afraid that everything's just set right and it will paralyze a lot of people. And the, really get content out there, just keep throwing it out there. And the most important part is to look what resonates. We might make 10 shows and nine of them are terrible and one is half decent. And we know, hey, let's try and do the half decent one again. But you know, there will be people like, well, get 50 episodes ready. That way you never miss uploading. It's like, well, if you make 50 episodes and they're all in the wrong content, you've just wasted a ton of time. And people, they're real good at letting you know what they do and don't like. There's, there's plenty of feedback coming back. You know, that's for sure. Um, but yes, good audio. You know, I'm wearing a lavalier mic. Even though we have two cameras right now, I'm wearing a mic. And that's what I would recommend is even something that's like a $20, $30 solution on Amazon will put you above most people, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Questions? What do you got? So your path is kind of like from the great, you know, uh, internet. Yep. Now you've gone into having your own store. 
and mine's kind of like the great store and now wanting to go to the internet. I'm just curious from your vantage point, what have you thought about in running your own store that could be helpful, I guess, for somebody like myself that's been doing that but not this? You know? Yeah. So the what's, you know, as I've been online and I have a store, the funny part is people, because the internet is so good at what it does, they don't realize I owned a store for years before I ever went online. That's what they, you know, people forget that, oh, you actually owned a retail store and you were just a local pet store before you ever went online. They just know, oh, this rise to, to you know, fame or whatever. And what I learned is, and this is why I think I have a good vantage point, is that once I realized that the internet was so powerful and I realized it actually in an aquatic experience. So I was doing my own little store thing and I was like, hey, check it out. We have, we're unboxing today. It's like, this is the fish that came in and there'd be 20 people that maybe watched it on Facebook and they would, they'd come in the next day. That's what we cared about is that we would unbox and they'd come in and they just want to see the fish in quarantine and that was working. That was bringing money in. And then we started filming uh, like maybe in your store, maybe you, once a week you're filming the, the breeding projects in the back room. And I, the big thing that really launched us was I built a fish room at home and I just documented everything. Like, oh, I'm going to Home Depot today because I got to buy plumbing parts and here's how you do that. And when I arrived at the Aquatic Experience, and this is probably five years ago now, we had like 28,000 subscribers. And at that time, 28,000 didn't mean anything to the business really because we weren't selling online or anything. It was like cool people enjoyed what we we're doing. But it was here that I realized that we were actually known because I came just like you guys. I was sitting in the audience, right? And people would come out there and be like, oh my God, it's Aquarium Co-op. Like, I love your videos. And I'd be like, whoa, that is crazy that to bring it in real life. Because just online numbers, you're like, yeah, whatever. And that's when I learned, wait a second, I could sell online. And wait a second, I could embrace this a little more and get people to travel to my store. Now it's been so successful, people travel from around the world. You know, it's not even just like, oh, we're really doing really well in Washington. It's people will drive for hours to get there. People are flying in to get there and it's become a destination. And I think the honest best takeaway though, and this is that whole, doesn't matter how many subscribers you have, is developing a routine that we get fish every Thursday or whatever it's gonna be. And we do an unboxing every Thursday and you just get your employees to start doing it. And that's one of the best things I would recommend is don't be afraid of your employees. So many companies I, uh, I kind of talk with, they're like, well, what do they say the wrong thing? It's like, it's no different. What do they say the wrong thing in front of your customer in your store? If you don't trust them enough to be one-on-one -on -one with someone, you should trust them enough to be one on a few people or a thousand people, whatever it's gonna be. Like, and so you'll get so much more back out of it, even when the mistakes are made. Um, but I love the fact that you can unbox and you're like, oh, the Cardinal Tetras already have ick. And then someone goes, hey, how do I treat ick? And now you're, you're explaining the meds they're gonna use and they come into the store and they buy them. And that's what really translated to each live stream. You know, YouTube might go, you made a dollar 12 for two hours of your time. Meanwhile, the Friday after we did the unboxing, we were like, whoa, we got tons of people coming in saying that they had watched what we did and now they wanna buy it. Well, it's still in quarantine but this is here and this is here and the traffic, you know, the one thing I would say is keep in mind, YouTube paid me $1.12 instead of me paying Facebook $20 to get the message out. That's a big difference when you're getting paid to show people stuff. And we always did passive selling. We never got on there and was like, you need to check out our latest Diet Coke. It was purely let someone ask like, what's new in the store? What are you working on? And we would show what we're testing and we'd show things that we necessarily didn't like, like, oh, we thought this was gonna be awesome, turns out it's not. Um, it gave you a chance to say, like, you know what? Flu ball cancer filters, I brought in the 07 series. We got mountains of them, apparently they're not selling. If you're watching this live stream though, and you come in, it's 10% off any of them. You know, it, it gave you the chance as the owner, and that's why it's important that the owner gets in on this, because you can instantly say, you know what? You're a 12 year old kid and you're having problems. If you come in, I'll give you the medicine. You know, you get these things, and by giving that kid the medicine, you just sold 20 other adults on supporting you. And so you got to do a great thing and then they want to come support you and it, you have the power to do that. And you, we used to have different uh, things going on, on Facebook. We had an employee that every shift they work, it was their job to feed some fish with a food. We didn't have, they, they could pick any food they wanted so long as 
they were feeding fish. People love to watch people or feed fish and watch that. But then eventually they'd ask a question like, what food was that? Why are you feeding that? Why do you carry that? And it would start a little bit of conversation. And they knew because we did it every day, it wasn't a sales pitch. It wasn't like, well, today we're doing Hikari and tomorrow we're doing Hikari. And it was just any food. And then they'd be, sometimes we'd do foods we don't even sell. We would show like, today we're feeding green beans out of the can because it's one of the best ones to bulk up plecos that we're getting in and we can feed the whole store and they last a long time in water and stuff like that. And we learned all these little subtle marketing things that were free and it's because we had zero budget. You know, that's the thing is how do we compete with you know, someone that is going to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have to bring our trust and our personality to the screen instead of hiring he or she that's a model, you know, and that, or, oh, that person looks very smart and they have all these credentials. We need to be the person of authority. And naturally, when we're in a store, we are the authority. There's so often, I want to speak to the owner. I want to do all this kind of stuff. And, well, you must know you have all these fish. And we get to exploit that in that, um, we get all of that praise right from the beginning. And the one thing I love to say is I don't know. Because when you really humanize yourself, you're like, yeah, I don't know that. I've never run into that. If you say that enough, people will know that when you don't know, you will say it. So that when you do say something and you know, they actually know you know. And it sounds weird to even say that, but so many people will never talk about a subject they don't know. They'll never admit they don't know something. They'll always make something up. And they don't realize that's actually undermining what they're actually trying to do. You want to be very, very knowledgeable in a couple of things. Like I, I myself consider myself fairly knowledgeable in live bears, African cichlids, community fish, and live plants. And then I know my weaknesses like Central and South American cichlids, whew, brutal. Like I can't remember half the names. I've kept most of them. But you want to let them know like here's my weak spots. And then those customers go, well, I'm not going to that guy. But everyone else going, but I love those things. I am going to that guy. And so I think, uh, you know, that's a great thing. I know I've gone to other stores and I've actually had their employees like, let's get on the camera. Teach me about this saltwater stuff that I don't know about. And I think one of the important parts is go into making a video, not so much with, I need to make money off this, but go into it thinking, how am I going to teach some people some stuff? If you actually pull that off, the money will come in eventually. It might not come in tomorrow, but... You know, even with the unboxings, our goal is to actually teach about fish, not so much get people to come in and buy them. That's actually the part we dread now. We dread the amount of people that will come in after we show the unboxing. We just want to educate so that, oh, now I know about Scarlet Baddest. I will get one of those in six months when I see it in the store. Not so much, I'm going to be there tomorrow hounding you to get it. Um, but that's kind of one of the necessary evils that come with doing some of that content. And you will bring a little bit of crazies out of the woodwork, but you'll bring in so many just normal people that like, finally, I was waiting for you to bring that fish in. And they were just listening to it at work because they always listen to the unboxings and you didn't even know they were really a fan. But as you build that out, you know, a year into it, you're like, oh my God, like who knew? Bob's one of my oldest customers. That guy's like 65. I never thought he'd be on social media listening. And turns out he came in because you brought in the brown fish he's been waiting for. And, uh, that's where that feedback loop is really good in person. And it's the thing I miss the most is the in-person feedback loop because now I'm pretty much only online because I, I get swamped in the store. But it is a very powerful thing and it allows you to uh, develop an audience that, you know, it's the only way I found to scale my time. That's really what it came down to. As a business owner, you might have so much going on, but how do you connect with, you know, oh, I used to be in the store 80 hours a week 40 years ago, you know, and now you're like, well, I'm really only on the floor like three hours a week because I'm kind of doing this and that and that. And you can still talk to all the people and all the friends and customers you've made over the years and they still know you're working there, you're still doing things. And uh, we still do it to this day where after hours I'll do it or I'll do it while I'm there. And don't be afraid to do it while the store is open. A lot of people wait till before or after. You want it so a customer walks in, they ask you a question and be like, oh, we're live right now. Like, what was the question? You know, and some people want to be a part of that, some don't, but that brings that whole real element to it of like, and people love it, like, oh man, they look busy. They must be a good store, I should come in. You know, we learned a lot of things. We used to have it where, right now we have a live camera on our puffer fish in our store, Murphy. And we thought it would be a great idea if they could see the whole store. And then we found out that people will call 
and be creepy when it's like, I see that no one's in there right now and the female employees got very weirded out. So we stopped that. But, you know, it was working very well. Like, oh, I see you have a moment. Hey, I had a question about a fish. That was fine until it was like, you know, we had one person call up like, oh, I could bring you dinner. Like, I see that there's no one else there and they were getting real creeped out. So we were like, oh, you can go too far down that rabbit hole too. We learned that, <laughs> you know. So we've, we've been down that gamut of like, there's, there's that oversharing of like, okay, that's unsafe. Didn't yeah. think about that. And, uh, but it's, I would never go back. In fact, all of my employees have the passwords to uh, Instagram, because that's the one we kind of value the least. A lot of them have access to Facebook and only three people, kind of Jimmy, myself, and Irene, have access to the YouTube. And it's just kind of permissions, like with Jimmy with my password, he can do everything except delete the channel. He could delete every video if he wanted. There's no way to restrict someone from having too much access on YouTube. But on Instagram and, and Facebook, the permissions, you can basically like, here, we'll let you in. Now you're, a, um, you know, don't make them an admin, but make them a, like an, an editor and that kind of stuff. And they can do stuff for you. And you'll be really surprised at what some of these employees can come up with for you. You're like, wow, you're a creative genius. Turns out I thought you were just, you know, an African cichlid nerd, but you're really good. You know, and you might have someone develop into a role for you that you didn't even know that was going to exist yet. And, uh, you know, we got employees that really started getting into it. Like once, once it got amplified outside the store, we'd always do sales in the store. We put a you know, whiteboard up with dry erase in the window. And then they would spend all week thinking like, what's the pun I'm going to put on there so that all the people on the internet will say how clever that is. And so you have all these people helping you come up with sale ideas and ways to market it because they're not having fun with it. And they get the feedback loop of people thought that was hilarious. And uh, it adds a little spice to work too. So uh, I found it to be very lucrative though. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if there's anyone that has questions after the fact, because some people don't like to ask now, uh, you can always hop into one of the live streams on the Corey McElroy channel and we can talk more about it as well, especially when you're like, I tried a thing, that didn't work, what should I do now? And you're like, oh, well, let's try this tweak or whatever, because it's, you know, hopefully you come away with one thing you want to try, but, you know, definitely willing to take other questions too. Anyone? Scary. All right. So what have you learned uh, from your time in China? And well, say China, Europe, and Israel that you could apply to your own store in the United States for your business? Yeah, so I went to China and I'll be going back next month and I went to Israel. Uh, what I've learned basically is that everyone loves fish no matter what you know political climate you're in or where you're from and products for the most part are the same. You know, there's different variations and stuff like that. It's funny to see, <coughs> it's funny to go see like, oh, there's an Aquatop product in 70 other brands. You know, it's like we think that people invent stuff and the reality is someone invents it then sells it and allows them to license it in america and that kind of stuff so you get to see some of the source and when you find the source of some of the stuff you actually see what all the incoming innovations are that we just haven't brought to the u.s yet like my favorite one still it's just now making its way here is um, the wi-fi controlled or, or app controlled canister filters and heaters and that kind of stuff so that when your tank starts overheating you get an alert on your phone you can race home and try and save your fish like that kind of stuff it's coming just no one in the U.S. market has laid out the cash flow for all the electronic ratings and stuff we're going to need because it's a pretty big expenditure. So it's fun to see and knowing where we're going to go. And then it makes me look like a genius when I'm like, this is what I've seen. It's going to come. And then it comes and you're like, wow, you called that. And it's like, well, it's not really calling it when you see it. You're like you just know it's coming, <laughs> you know, you know. So it's really easy. Like, and you get to, you get to watch evolutions, right? So cobalt is out there and they've been around for a while and now they have Aqua L on there. Well, I learned that they work with Aqua L, which is a Poland company. And I saw, you know, they're the ones actually doing the Wi-Fi heaters and the canisters. And I fully expect them to launch that into the US market and everything. And so you can kind of see these partnerships developing and where they're sourcing products and, and that kind of stuff. And it's lucrative for a guy like me that will bring in my own products, but it's also just good to know maybe I shouldn't go crazy down the rabbit hole on this cancer filter if I know probably in the next year this technology is hitting and all the consumers are going to go, ooh, that's what I have to have now. I've been burned that way with like Phoenix as an example. You know, we, they did ran a big sale and this was back before I was online. They ran a big sale, buy all these lights. It was the, um, it was the Planted Plus. And then, you know, literally in December, they're like, cool, the new light's out. And so the new light came out and 
we had to basically sell off all the old lights at cost because every consumer wanted the new light. Who's going to pay full retail for the old model? Nobody. And so we learned to be reserved in like, oh, it seemed too good to be true, it was too good to be true. And, uh, you know, we started looking into the future more of like, well, what's coming out so we don't do that again? And same thing in a small business, even if you only have 30 of a product, it's like if that takes you a year to sell, make sure that a better mousetrap's not coming out and you're stuck with it because it, it might only be a few hundred dollars, but a few hundred dollars at this size of business is the same as $30,000 at this size of business. It's all percentage base. So, um, but yeah, I'm excited to go back to China. You meet a lot of friends. It's funny, there's a lot of people out and the manufacturers that I was never friendly with tell you're all stuck in a foreign country and you're the only ones that speak English. So, you know, you, you buddy up real quick, like, hey, where's the bathroom? Hey, where can we eat? Where, you know, how do you use this part of the subway? That kind of stuff. And um, it's fun to see them in different countries. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite ones is there's Patrick from API. I'm kind of at war with API in terms of their corporation, but me and him are great buddies. You know, it's kind of this weird dichotomy of, you know, we'll go out to dinner and it's always like, you should carry more of a product. I'm like, yeah, you should be fair to the hobby. <laughs> and that's kind of where it ends. We kind of know it's this ongoing little rivalry. And someday maybe it'll work out and someday it won't, but the friendship is great. And, uh, you know, and I've put him in contact with our stores and other markets too. Like I told him, I was like, oh, well, test kits from Sarah are, doing really well in Israel. And he's like, oh, I need to get back to Israel and do some marketing. And so even though I might not be bringing his product in, I can help him in a market that I have no control over, but I, I saw this while I was there. And uh, so it worked out well. And I think that with, with online, I, w I won't pretend to say that like, as you get a bigger follower count, you will just straight up get better deals from all the manufacturers. That's just the way it happens. And when you send an email and it says, I need a store test unit, and they don't send one. Now it's how many would you like? I, I remember asking Fluval and Phoenix for just lights for uh, a project that's going to be online or in my store and them going, well, if you buy $10,000, we'll give you 10% off and that kind of stuff. And now it's like they ask, just, just let me know. Anytime you want to do something, just let me know. You know, and the role reverses. And I always tell them like, you should have gotten on that way sooner. You should really investigate. And a lot of times they won't. They'll just see a follower count and they'll never look to, is your content good? Are people even watching it? So the fact that we have 350,000 YouTube followers is actually relatively low. That's our worst stat. Though our watch time and the amount of views we get is off the charts, but the average person doesn't know how to see that. And so they actually don't know that we're really, really doing well. They're going, you only have 350,000. You know, the King of DIY has over a million. It's like, but we're getting the same amount of views. You know, so it's like, and with YouTube, and I kind of left that off earlier, they haven't cared about subscribers in a long time and they still don't care about a subscriber. Whether you ever subscribe to a channel or not has no bearing on whether they'll see your videos. If you watch a video and you like it and you watch another video, YouTube will ram Aquarium Co-op down your throat for like the next three months. That's just the way, if you never interact again, they'll let it drop off. But if you interact and you keep interacting, they're gonna keep serving it, whether you ever like us or not. And You'll find that as you get more into the social media, you know, you'll get these people who are like, I've been watching you for two years, and then they'll pull you up and you're like, you're not even subscribed, <laughs> you know? And they'll be like, you're right, I'm not. And it's just because that's the way the platform's built now. And so the real currency I think that's gonna become uh, very important is paid memberships. Um, I have it on my channel, Facebook has rolled it out and that type of thing. And what they basically want is, it's not good enough for someone just to watch your content. They want to uh, invest in you so it's five dollars to get kind of behind the scenes content, right? And I actually, so I'm on the, the 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 beta team for that program, some other programs with YouTube, and I meet with them once a week. But I, I think where it's heading, because they'll never tell you where it's going, but I think where they're heading is it'll be a new way to advertise so that as, let's say, Fluval or something, they could just advertise on my channel, right? But that's gonna, they're gonna have to market to millions of people that watch every month. But if they could market to just the people that are willing to spend $5 to see the behind the scenes stuff, the conversion rate is like 100 times higher. So now they only have to market to way less people. You know, maybe it's 500 people. And it might cost a dollar to market each one, but the conversion rate is at least half of them will buy the product. You know, so that, I think that's where YouTube is going. And Facebook, same thing. We can now do paid groups where you have to pay to be a member of it. And 
everything is driven by money, obviously. And what people want to do is they want to invest money safely. We've all heard about controversy on YouTube about, oh, well, Disney's pulling out and this is pulling out because of content. The people that are behind the paywall, it's even safer. And so that's really where people want to market. It's just like, I would pay a lot more money to be able to advertise to your customers directly instead of having to advertise your city. If I could just get a hold of your newsletter list and advertise to them directly, that's clearly going to be a better return on my money. They're already paying, so paying members of your stores. We already know they're buying products instead of just having to people advertise to people that have owned an aquarium at some point. And so, yeah. More questions? Doesn't have to be about business. Yep. Um, to hone in more on, because I know you said you should con kind of concentrate on one platform. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the platforms have like the story and you could post the live videos and obviously on your timeline and stuff. Is, do you think there's like a, a more important, other, I mean, I know you like the live stream, but so like, sh do you think it's value added to do the story? Definitely, yes. Like so what, one of the big takeaways is that, so we have aquarium co-op fans, or at least that's what we used to think. We used to think like, oh, we have fans that like aquarium co-op, maybe on YouTube or maybe on Facebook. And the reality is you do have that, but what you actually have is you have aquarium co-op live stream fans. You have aquarium co-op story fans. You have aquarium co-op Instagram fans. And each one of those things do different things. Like on YouTube, for instance, the stories are shown almost exclusively to people who aren't subscribed to you. And that's a way to like lure new people in. And a lot of people won't know that we do f stories all the time and because they're just not, they don't consume that because it's usually a younger demographic that's really into stories. Um, but if you wanna get that 13 to 19 year old into your store, stories is how to do it. You know, the actual videos and that kind of stuff, not so much. Um, but yes, that is, it all works together in that, you know, you can put out content, then you can drive people back to that content. Maybe three or four days later, be like, wow, this was a really good seminar. Make sure you check it out. That's a way to re bring them back. You can also do the people that are really doing well in stories, they'll plan what they're going to do. They might film it and it's a one minute, two minute video and then chop it up into the 15 second things so that you'll watch the first 15 seconds go, oh, I have to hear the answer. You'll watch the next 15 seconds. And then by the end of that 15 seconds, you've given another little question, you want to hear the answer. And by the time you watch four segments, YouTube has locked you into my channel forever because now you've consumed four pieces of content in a row, you're binge watching us. And so you took the same thing you might've made a video about and turned it into, oh, you just filled out this survey four times. You're hyper engaged, even though it's the same amount of work. And so it's not the same work, amount of work for the creator, but it's the same amount for the end user of like, they watched a minute either way, but now they've watched for videos and they will treat that differently both in Facebook and YouTube. So, you know, different things work for different people. You get access to different things at different times, you know, so sometimes you might not qualify for that, but I highly recommend using it. And what you won't know is that you'll be hitting different demographics and you hit different things and there's different ways to advertise. And what, you know, I was, I was always against the stories train until, um, basically my YouTube manager and stuff was like, you gotta be doing this. Like it's one of the biggest things you're missing out on. And now that I do it, I love it. And it's using all the, you know, as I thought, stupid emojis and stickers and that kind of stuff. And people love it. They just love to see, you know, I went and spoke at Aquashella, you know, like 10 days ago, and they love to see that I was stuck at the airport for seven hours because of wind and that kind of stuff. They just love to see what's going on behind the scenes. They love to see, you know, big shipments. It doesn't matter what it is. It's like it's a 15 second, you know, to a minute little clip that is not worthy of making a whole production out of, but if 10 people resonate with it, it was well worth your time. And that's what I find. And it builds a story. What they, what they do now is they basically brought stories on because it humanizes us again from a production company to we are people again. And they realize that without the people, people stop watching. And so it's very common for a channel like ours to get bigger and bigger and bigger and lose more and more touch with our audience instead of like, oh, I'm in the bathroom at the hotel, like we're getting ready for the show today. Like they want, and I say they, like probably some of you guys want to see that kind of stuff and maybe not you in particular, but in general, 
even if you would fill out a survey, you never want to see that. It reminds you that at the end of the day, I'm just a fat guy who eats candy that doesn't want to do his hair. You know, like that's, you know, ah, it's like me. I, I like to do that. I like fish. I like, it's a perfect thing to, and so instead of like maybe documenting all of aquatic experience, one of the best things could do be like, this was my favorite flower horn. Oh, this was my favorite thing. It's all these little snippets going. And it also works really well when you don't have good connection. Um, and in general, I think it's just a good way to utilize your time. And it, they, they build the algorithm so that, you know, oh, they clicked on a thing, now they're gonna get this. And that it really, you know, their whole goal is to make them watch longer. So every time they put something out, they're doing it to help you, not hurt you. And most people won't embrace the new technology and that's what puts you ahead, is that most people go, ah, we're doing fine with this, that's just one more thing we gotta do. And if you just switch to that, a lot of times you'll get, like they're pushing stories a hundred times harder than videos right now because almost no one makes stories. And so you'll get exponential uh, stuff and stories for the most part until people figured out that we could you know, make these highly produced things, they were always raw. And so companies like Fluval and stuff that are outside there would never do a story. We can't chance that someone will say the wrong thing, we'll lose too much face, right? And so you've then eliminated a lot of your competition and we know they're pushing it way harder than they ever have of anything. You get thrown to the front and you'll see it when you open up like your YouTube app or your Facebook app, you'll see you're like, why do I have stories from people I've never looked at before? And it's because there's a shortage of them and they really want, if, they, if you can sit through 15 seconds and then go, well, let's see if they can fit through you know, a three minute video. Let's see if they can sit through, that's how they're sampling now is, hey, try this food. Oh, it's terrible. Then you, then you know, you know, or like, oh, that's not so bad. And then like, well, here, here's a free dinner tomorrow night. Try it out. And then hopefully you come back every week. And that's, you know, that's what they're trying to do. It's also a way that in general, we won't give people time. We're like, I'm not gonna sit through an ad to watch their video, but there's no ads with stories. So it's like, oh, I can consume it really quick. And because there's that tap feature of like, oh, let's watch the new story, people keep doing that. And pretty soon they're watching another creator they never knew about. And so that's how they can start bringing and, and bring stuff in without knowing it. So it, it does work out well. I wouldn't say it's a great selling tool, but it's a great, like, this is just who I am, brand awareness. I would have never found you otherwise type of thing. And, uh, you know, they're, they're from at least the metrics I have and the access of people I have to, you only want to do like three to five a week. It's not something you want to do like all the time. You don't want to spam people. But even just three to five 15 second things a week is more than enough. And, uh, you know, tr and they do say try to do it, you know, like maybe do one of the segments they suggested to me was a Tuesday tip. You know, like every Tuesday, like here's a quick thing you might want to know you know, whether you're a full line pet store or not, just like every Tuesday, oh yeah, let's see what the tip was. And uh, they know that even if it never applies to them, they're only out 15 seconds, so they'll consume it. And if they ever get value once, they'll consume it forever. So you've got a lot of chances to give them one little thing. Um, and it could be as simple as, by the way, if you forget and leave your bloodworms on the counter, don't put them back in the freezer, they will have spoiled. You know, just something as easy as that and passively, we've now sold more bloodworms. Hey, we did that. We should go buy new ones. You know, it could be that simple. But um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. And so far, only I've done it. I haven't had any employees do it yet, but we totally could start sprinkling them in. And you'll be surprised that, like, I only resonate typically with male viewers, and we have female employees, and they resonate with the female viewers and that kind of stuff. And so you can really bolster out by including your crew, too which not everyone gets a crew. I was the same way for a long time. It was only me, but eventually you will have employees and you'll find ones that are really good at it. So yeah, what time is it? Do we have? Time's up, Time's up I'm told. So if you want any more info, uh, go to the YouTube channel, Corey McElroy, ask questions. We do, I don't have a set schedule because it's like the only thing I do that doesn't make me money is help other businesses, but um, I do it periodically and I hope to do it more. And hopefully if you like this talk, go ahead and vote. If you didn't like this talk, go ahead and vote anyway, because that'll help other people. And uh, maybe I'll be back next year and we'll have more Q&A. Survey's not working yet. Awesome. It might not work till the end. It's to my advantage. No, the other surveys are working. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, that's, 
I knew it. I knew API was after me. No. <laughs> well, thank you all. And uh, next up, my of the speakers I know, my recommendation is go see Chris Lukup speak about shrimp. He's one of my good buddies. So he's up next. Not in this room, I don't think, but uh, yeah. Next door. Yeah, next door. Next door. Perfect.